Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Gilman, and I will be your moderator for the session on the power of corporate brands to advance progress toward the sustainable development goals. I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to have, and I'm grateful that you're all here to join us. This webcast is brought to you by the Zayed Sustainability Prize, the UAE's pioneering annual global award in sustainability that recognizes and rewards the achievements of those who are driving impactful, innovative, and inspiring sustainability solutions across five distinct categories, health, food, energy, water, and global high schools. The prize is accepting applications through June 11th, and we hope all of you will consider applying and passing this opportunity on to someone you know. So, I am very excited to introduce our guest today, Dr. Miriam Sidibe. Miriam is the co-founder and author of Brands on a Mission. Brands on a Mission is a movement to catalyze and generate an additional $1 billion investment in sustainable business models that address health and well-being, contributing to the achievement of the SDGs by 2030. It's also a framework to help businesses achieve social impact and business growth through purpose. Prior to this, Miriam had a 15-year career at Unilever and spearheaded a movement to change the hand-washing behavior of 1 billion people globally, which they achieved in 2019. She also conceived of and helped establish the multi-award winning UN Recognized Global Handwashing Day, now celebrated annually in over 100 countries. So I will have a really dynamic, engaging conversation here. And I have a few questions for Miriam to start the conversation, and there will also be time for questions from you all. So please enter questions in the chat box, and we'll be sure to try and get to all, all that we can during this time. Miriam, we are thrilled to have you. How are you doing today? Thank you very much, Marisa. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And we were starting to chat before the call, and unfortunately, viewers couldn't hear some of the things that we were talking about, but you have been incredibly busy. So there is a lot for us to discuss and really excited to dive into the work that you've been doing. Delighted to have this conversation. I think it's going to be a, a very interesting conversation and I'm calling in from Kenya today. Great. Well, welcome. So I want to start with the work that you've been doing on hand washing. Um, you know, I've seen your TED talk and was incredibly inspired. And it also felt very insightful and especially relevant for the current climate, looking at the role of behavior change in saving lives and looking at the role of a brand to drive impact. And I'd really strongly encourage all of our viewers to check that out as well. You can find it on tedtalk.com. How did you get started with this important work? Thank you very much, uh, Marisa. I, um, I, I have been thinking about hand washing and dreaming about um, the kind of things that are currently going on on hand washing um, for the last 20 years. And uh, I'm delighted to see some, you know, some of the activities that are currently going on with every world leaders actually calling upon people to wash their hands and, you know, every celebrity actually, you know, singing and dancing and thinking about hand washing with soap. But, I, you know, the, the part that obviously saddens me is that, you know, this is this is coming um, as a response to uh, a world pandemics and, um, and a global health crisis. But um, you know, I, I have been thinking about hand washing with soap, as I said, over 20 years. I finished a doctorate in, uh, in um, uh, well, an engineering degree in, in McGill University and ended up uh, working for a couple of years for um, an in international rescue committee, a refugee um, a company in, in, in refugee camp, in internally displaced camps in, in, in Burundi. And as I was building um, toilets, um, uh, and, you know, for my for, for the IDP that I was working in, I started realizing that people weren't using them, and that people were using them to be able to store um, bags of of of, um, of grains or anything else that they would have that's valuable that needed a place for storing, but that they would keep, um, you know, going to open defecation. And I I started thinking that maybe one of the key areas that one needed to focus on was how do you get people to use the infrastructures that the donors desperately wanted to spend some of its money on? And how do you convince some of these communities that it is absolutely important to practice hygiene? So I went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to do a doctorate in public health, looking at um, behavior change and how do you get people to wash their hands with soap and use those toilets? Um, and, you know, and at the time, the Lancet had just published a, a systematic review which looked at, you know, you know, uh, people were actually, um, you know, you could save over 45% of diarrheal cases, um, you know, through hand washing with soap and respiratory infections by over 25%. And I thought, wow, okay, so there is enough that one could learn on hand washing to make a real impact on, on, on public health. 
And then as I was thinking about, uh, um, you know, what I would do, and I, I came back with the research, you know, I went to do my, my research in Senegal, in Indonesia, in Timor. And then I came back and my supervisor, Val Curtis, you know, told me, let's go and present to, the, to Unilever, who's the world's largest soap manufacturers, your findings around hand washing with soap. And then as I was presenting my findings and the motivations, factors that kids would get kids to wash their hands and what would be important, um, you know, they basically decided that, you know, it would be quite interesting to give me a, a job. And then I, you know, nothing had really prepared me for a job in the, in the, in the non-profit uh, world at all. And, and, you know, and for profit companies like Unilever and the world's largest soap manufacturers. But then I thought, well, you know, look, one of the key takeaway was that we needed social marketing campaigns. And I said, well, these guys are doing quite a great job selling their soap. So maybe we could do some interesting programs around hand washing with soap here that could be of use to the world. And that's basically how I found myself sitting in marketing. And then I was very clear from the start that I didn't want to sit in, in CSR and comms, which anyway, CSR ended up being disbanded from the company a few years later. I was really clear that the most powerful uh, uh, profession, but then I joined marketing. And, um, you know, and I, I, I really, there was something that struck me very quickly is that I, I started, you know, I just fell in love with the word. I fell in love with the word consumer <laughs> very quickly. And then people were, you know, naively, you know, after, you know, after a first job where I really did not like the word beneficiaries that seemed very disempowering, you know, coming from an NGO sector where, you know, everybody was looking to figure out how to address the needs. And then it felt very disempowering as a young African. And then joining the private sector and you know I, I i i you know i came across this word consumer and here there was these entire teams of marketing whose job it was to actually look at this woman the same woman i was calling a beneficiary and think about how much she was spending what fragrance she wanted where she wanted that soap how much price she was willing to pay for it what kind of packaging we needed and i just I was like, this is the most powerful word in the world, the word consumer, you know, because that same woman became all of a sudden very empowered to me because whatever money she was, she had people, you know, there were teams of people whose job it was to make sure that, you know, she could spend it on, on the same product we were trying to do. On one hand, I was trying to build hand washing facilities, um, you know, from a donor perspective to a beneficiary. From the other hand, I was actually you know, and expecting and understanding why she would want to buy this particular soap to wash her hands. So it felt like the right place to be. I mean, this was 15 years ago, but you know, I, you know, consumers, that word absolutely felt fantastic. Now, obviously 15 years later, I, I have a lot more understanding of the nuance of the word consumer, <laughs> and I have a better understanding of all the multi-sectoral collaborations that are required to really put, you know, that same woman um, at the at the at the core of the conversation, and I and you know, and especially to make sure that her needs are are catered all throughout. So, I, you know, you know, I nuanced that word, but I think coming out of you know, as a 25 year old joining a multinational, you know, you think about it, it felt it felt extremely empowering, <laughs> and it felt that as a young African, that this was a place where I could make a real difference. That makes sense. And what I'm hearing is it was both empowering on a personal level, but then also empowering for the people that you wanted to support and that you wanted to grow as well. And I really love that the way that you unpacked the word consumer versus beneficiary too, you know, because at the end of the day, you're doing this work to improve quality of life, whether you're in a nonprofit or you're in a private sector company that also happens to need to make revenue. Um, and, and that actually leads to the book that you just published, Brands on a Mission. And in this book, you know, you're exploring the importance of both creating a corporate culture that is built on driving impact through purpose, but also, you know, how do you staff up a company in that way? And I'm curious how you think, how you think about that, you know, how, how does this approach of having a company that both has a mission, whether it's to empower women or it's, you know, to do some other social good, but they also need to generate revenue. How does that fit within our current landscape as well as, you know, in the next couple of years as we are figuring out what the world looks like post COVID? Yeah, no, I think this is a very, um, and I think, you know, I wrote this book. I didn't know obviously there was going to be COVID-19. I did not know. 
<laughs> there was going to be a global pandemic. At the core of it, that my life work of hand washing with soap would be the only thing that people could do whilst we wait for vaccines. I, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I was writing this book to be able to not only talk about the journey that I've been through over the last two decades to put, you know, to, to help drive and steer um, the world's largest hand washing movement, but most importantly, just to give a framework for companies and brands that want to bridge the divide between what they say versus what they do and drive more impact. And genuinely, um, I genuinely believe in the power of the private sector in trying to do good and, and, and especially in the health sector, because I felt that in, in so much of, um, and you know what I'm going to talk about because obviously you are also in health, but you know, you, you think about how much of these diseases are preventable and how much of those diseases are actually driven by bad consumerism whether it is not washing your hands, not brushing your teeth, it's eating the wrong food, um, you know, and you think, actually, like, imagine how much money is spent on marketing. If you could steer and infuse some of these marketing budgets with more values and processes, the world, in terms of preventing some of these diseases, will be absolutely better. You know, so that was my starting point anyway, and I thought, you know, and I, I only want to focus on health and well-being, because that's the, that's the part that I love and that's the part that, you know, I, I, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life thinking about that. And, you know, I want to drive public health because I believe that public health is the, the foundation of social justice, that without health, there will be no social justice. And I think COVID-19 has come and it's basically highlighted all the inequalities that exist in this world uh, and how fragile some of our systems are and how healthcare can be overwhelmed <laughs> and then how prevention is the only way, the only current vaccines that we have at the moment um, in trying to out the spread of COVID-19. So for me, it, you know, it, it became so clear um, that you know, there was a role for all these private sectors and all these businesses to join in the wagon, not necessarily as providers of philanthropy, but rather to put their core businesses as a way to answer some of these questions. And, and, you know, it, it, and, and funny enough, you know, here I am in COVID-19 thinking about how do I get people to wash their hands more? <laughs> you know, how do I get, um, you know, we, we've been talking about 1 billion people washing hands, uh, you know, when I was at Lifebuoy. Now all of a sudden we need 7 billion people. You know, that you would set this goal to reach a billion people in hand washing, and now we need to have the entire world be washing hands with soap, and yeah. that it's a huge endeavor. And, and, yeah, and wearing masks, and understanding you know what uh, physical distancing actually really means, um, you know, and, and all these uh, uh, you know behavioral elements. And and then at the heart of this, I you know like I was like, well, actually, this is what businesses do. This is where businesses can really reward some of these. Uh, you know, socially needed behaviors these days. You know, it's not, this is not now, uh, this is not like a, maybe I want to do it, maybe I don't. Actually, I do need good nutrition to keep my immunity level up in order for me to combat COVID-19 should I get it. I need to wear my mask to protect others. You know, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm having a, a real conversation with, you know, I, I understand that physical distancing does not mean social distancing, that I, I do, you know, stay positive and, and you know, and, and, and mind my neighbor's, you know, mental health, but I, I know I understand that physical is the right way to do that. I, I think there is so many behavioral elements in which I, I believe today that businesses can play an active role on, on responding um, and making some of these behaviors rewarded, celebrated, um, you know, and that all of a sudden becomes the core of what this book is actually about. Um, and, and, and then how do you make sure that this book, you know, this, this framework now is guiding, not only after COVID-19, because it was, it was never designed necessarily for COVID-19, but I'm realizing that it's an important framework. Today, as, as, as companies are thinking about their own business resilience, um, to think about not only their employees, but what I'm considering the most important stakeholders in stakeholder capitalism, the communities in which they operate and the communities to whom they sell. You know, so I, 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 you know, I think about this quite a lot in terms of how this framework is gonna be absolutely um, useful um, for rebuilding a new world and new world order, but also a, a way in which we will be able to today to help and support the state, um, you know, respond to this crisis because you know, we are not going to win in COVID-19, this war against COVID-19, by staying isolated from what the, you know, it needs to happen as a society. So businesses have a clear role to play and they need a framework in which they can do that. 
that is supportive, that is inclusive, that is, you know, keeping in mind everything that is in this framework that bridges the divide between what we say and what we do so that we can enhance impact because there is no time now to, to, to not be clear and to keep best class um, uh, uh, practices at the heart of the fight against COVID-19. I'm curious, you know, so that this webinar series is in support of the Zayed Sustainability Prize. And we have a lot of innovators, entrepreneurs, and nonprofit actors that are all passionate about coming up with ideas to make a difference, you know, to be able to move the needle in terms of social outcomes. And based on your history and experience of promoting behavior change, of working from within corporations, you know, of working with communities to drive change, what advice would you have for these innovators, for these entrepreneurs and nonprofits that are starting something from scratch right now? What would you say to them in order to make sure that they're leading with purpose um, and creating something that, that could be effectual? Well, I, I, I would start with identifying that there is a real need, right, in society. And I think given where we are today, I think there's going to be, you know, I, I don't think consumerism for the sake of consumerism is going to increase. I think people are going to be thinking about, uh, you know, a consumerism that's actually linking people to each other, that is, you know, putting empathy, compassion, that's going to really be thinking about connecting the world. And, you know, I've just done a talk, um, you know, on, on the call to unite. I don't know whether you saw that with, you know, Oprah, Julia Roberts, and, and a few other celebrities. And, and then, you know, I was like, the uniting elements between all of us today is actually hand washing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're doing it with a tippy tap in a rural area in Turkana in Kenya, or you're doing it in, in you know, in Japan in a, in a fancy um, bathroom that you can command. The point is today that is the uniting behavior that we're putting towards. So I, I would say, I would say start with a consumer needs that is really in line with what, you know, the consumer mind frame is going to be, because what's going to be important is, 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 is you know, an increased shared humanity. I, I mean, at least I believe that strongly you know so that you know people are going to be reaching out for more human experience less about customer experience and ways to spend your money but more human experience so i would say if i was an entrepreneur and i am actually an entrepreneur in different ways is find way to connect uh, um, to each other through a human experience and whatever products you are creating needs to be centered around this human experience that emph emphasizes compassion empathy ways in which we can connect with each other so that the world is less in non-profit versus profit, but actually more in terms of how do we solve those societal issues that are at the core of, you know, the, the kind of world in which we're living in at the moment where we're seeing those inequalities coming so strongly at the forefront of the conversation. That makes total sense. And I feel like, you know, ensuring that we are thinking of people as human beings and really driving innovation grounded in need. And I feel like that ties back to this, this concept of a consumer as well and being empowered, you know, thinking of these people as human beings and how do we improve quality of life through them through for like through these innovations that we're developing. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's more and more. It's I, I, I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. I think uh, given where we are today, I mean, anything that is not related today actually to relieving the stress and the, and the burden or the difficulties of, of, of overcoming COVID-19 is, is that's what everybody wants, right? It's how do you leave this physical distancing better? You know, in a way that makes you feel more connected, you know, is what people are looking for, you know? And any product that's gonna enable you to do that um, you know, and, and, and I don't think there's going to be a return to the normal. It's going to be a different kind of normal. And I, you know, and, and I, you know, that's, that's at least where I'm looking at this. And this is what reimagining this world um, and this new capitalist world is going to be absolutely critical. Yeah, you know, and I think it now is a great time to transition to questions from the audience because we actually have a number of questions that are related to that topic. Um, one person had asked, if you could speak about the intersection of environmental sustainability with brands on a mission, um, such as plastic waste from packaging, runoff from chemicals. I'm not sure if that's an, a component that, that you've addressed in the past. I, absolutely, I have. Um, the book doesn't talk too much about environmental uh, sustainability, but my background is very much in environmental health, right? Yeah, no, so I think um, the, my background is in environmental health and, um, you know, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot also and having been, especially in the consumer world where you have to think about packaging and, and plastics as well, 
Um, so I've done quite a lot of work lately as well, working with um, even Danone um, and some of their water bottle recycling, thinking about what do you do in terms of getting the consumer to recycle more? You know, so what do you do in terms of, and so this framework works just as equally for, for environmental sustainability as well as, a, as a health practices, because, you know, it's about driving behavior change, right? It's about when you pick up something, um, you know, that has, you know, plastic wrapping or plastic bottles, you know, how do you encourage the consumer to then think of a place where they can have recycled this or they can choose a product based on, you know, what sort of um, packaging it's actually at. So there is, that framework works very well in understanding what kind of behaviors is required, what will drive a consumer to want to take um, the steps towards recycling and how do you encourage this further. You know, the framework will also look at the kind of partnership that's required for you to improve the packaging, but also to get more consumers to, you know, nudge each other and also to think about, you know, which other uh, uh, companies could you work with. The framework will work very well in terms of systemic change in brand advocacy, because, you know, it's not going to be about one company um, you know, uh, uh, solving the plastic issue. It's going to be about many companies working together, um, you know, to actually be able to solve the plastic issue. You know, this is not going to be a one company only. Um, and, and, and if there is innovation in one, it needs to be shared across because I think that's an issue that's going to be affecting all of us, not just one. So, you know, so I think you'll find that the framework is applicable to most of the SDGs. It's just that, and, 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 and in there I'm talking about environment, as well as uh, you know, climate change and how you will work on that. But, but in this particular book, or at least book one, <laughs> is really focused on health and well-being. And because I, that's the part that I felt that I could address the quickest and the fastest to start with. That makes sense. But what I'm hearing you say is that behavior change is behavior change at the end of the day, whether it's to improve hand washing with soap or to train, you know, to encourage recycling behaviors. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So there is, there's always multi layers, right? So there is what you need to do in terms of um, innovate, product innovations, which will be, you know, at company led, but there is what you do to make sure that you encourage your consumers to be able to practice some of these behaviors. And I think that's where the framework actually is very useful, because it really bridges that divide very well. And, I, I, and this is where we're at at the moment. And so we have another question tying back to the role of a corporation. And this person's asking, how do you balance the innate mission of a corporation to make profits with your mission to change the world for the better? And this person was noting that Unilever seems to be unique in its work. And I think meaning that, you know, it's, it's clear to see that there is a tie between hand washing and using soap and a positive social outcome. And how might we apply this concept to other for-profit companies where perhaps the we don't immediately see as clear a connection? So yeah, that's a very good question. And that's a question, obviously, that I've addressed in my HBR article. Yeah. Um, that, that is currently, uh, you know, on the cover of HBR May, June, and, uh, and <clears throat> that is in there. And I think the conversation for me is, uh, is I, don't, I don't think that it is only for companies or brands uh, that are uh, directly linked. I think it's easier when you are a toothpaste to talk about oral health and to talk about you know, uh, solving you know, school absenteeism by getting kids to brush their teeth more often so they get less oral health disease. I think it's easier because there is a direct link between you, know, you having and driving purpose and your, your products and your sales. But I do think, and in the case in HBR, for example, I talk about calling Black Label and what they're currently doing with their campaign on hashtag no excuses and trying to reduce gender-based violence by imparting and changing the, 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 the norms around gen, uh, ma, um, toxic masculinity and training more men, champion men around the, uh, South Africa so that people recognize um, what are some of the values that make a, a, a real man a man. And this does not include, um, obviously, gender-based violence. So I do think there is a, a, an opportunity in some of these other um, and, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, brands to be able to address that. If you are a bouillon cube and you, you, know, you, you do dry with flavor, but you can get more women to eat more you know, uh, green leafy vegetables so that you can increase the iron intake, that's again another example. It's not directly linked to the product, but it is somehow a way in which you can improve nutrition and improve dietary diversity. So I think there are 
moments so i draw the line obviously in health in you know in products with you know harmful use is actually you know devastating for health right so you know like i, I stay away from you know from gun and i stay away from uh, you know like uh, some of these these, um, these 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 products but i do think that there is a way in which we can moderate consumerism in a way that's um, positive for public health in general and that's what the book really is about yeah, I mean, I, I think that that work is so important, you know, and we have one more question and then we'll we'll wrap up and it's thinking about the extension of brands, you know, because we have the brand itself, but brands are also interacting with downstream supply chain actors, such as factories and processing centers and how I think there's two things. One, you know, in light of the current COVID times, like how do we ensure that all players are taking into account the responsibility that they hold to ensure that people are safe? And two, how do you ensure that you're working with parties that, uh, that live up to your core values as a brand and as a company? That's a very important question. And I, cause I do think what you have when you're looking at some of these companies is the muscle power of the entire value chain and the entire supply chain, right? So it's working throughout your manufacturing, working through your retailers. You know, it's about making sure that the small duka in a place in, in Kenya, for example, knows the messages around oral health or knows the messages around hand washing with soap, um, you know, in a way that uh, you know, he can sell the product to these low income people. And today, when you think about COVID-19, one of the initiatives I've started, for example, is the National Business Compact in Kenya, um, you know, where I've, I've created a platform of collaborations of businesses, um, you know, overseen by the UN and the, and the Ministry of Health and national and non-governmental organization. But one of the key vehicles and places in which we are working with is actually through this entire distribution chain, especially the small retailers that are actually selling some of these products or some of these companies because they have an access and a reach that you can use to be able to also talk about hand washing with soap, make sure that soap is being distributed, that hand washing facilities are put in place. So I do think a partnership across, and, and I've seen that in Unilever, especially when it comes to changing the culture. When it is Global Hand Washing Day or when it is World Oral Health Day, you'd get all your, your retailers and um, as well asking you, what's the plan? What are you trying to do during this time? You know, and they would come and ask the brands in advance, like what promotion am I going to be able to put out because it's gonna be Global Hand Washing Day and I want more people to talk about this. And I want, obviously, um, it's part of the plan and the promotion plan. And that's what we need to do is to embed purpose across everything because that is the only way it not only gets embedded but it, it creates companies and, and and across and i'm not i'm talking about the small smes that you're going to employ across i'm talking about the small world of farmers that you will be purchasing some of your your ingredients from all the way to selling it it will be the right way in which you will empower to be able to respond as well and i think that's a very important element here that we, we can you know we can we can talk about. I think that's such an important thing and it's such a, a meaningful note to end on as well, thinking about how do we embed purpose across the value chain and really ensure that it's integral to every component of our business. And with that, that's all the time that we have. I had so many more things I wanted to chat with you about, Miriam, but the time just kind of flew by. Um, I wanna thank you so much for your insights on the power of corporate brands to advance progress towards the sustainable development goals. And um, please be sure to check out her new book, Brands on a Mission, How to Achieve Social Impact in Business Growth Through Purpose. Thank you to all our participants watching this webinar live or recorded. We really appreciate you taking the time. And lastly, please don't forget, spread the word about our fast approaching deadline for the Zayed Sustainability Prize on June 11th. For more information, you can visit ZayedSustainabilityPrize.com. And you can also follow the Zayed Sustainability Prize on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn for future webinars and for the latest information on this exciting global competition. Thank you again, Miriam. And thank you everyone, please stay safe. Thank you very much.